Go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke, um, the third chapter. Hallelujah. I want to make a statement that's, that's not relevant to our service this morning. I have made it on Wednesday nights a couple times, but I want to make it on Sunday morning. Make sure our Sunday morning crowd hears this. Um, there, are, there are different ways to study the Bible. This, this really isn't part of the service. It won't hurt to put it on the Internet, but it's not part of our service. Uh, you know, and, and one of the, the primary ways people study the Bible and have for probably past century primarily in churches is what we refer to as systematic theology. Now, systematic theology is the study of, of Bible subjects. So you might study uh, Christology. You might study um, faith. You might study grace. You might study love. And what we typically do in that is we'll go get all the scriptures that deal with that subject, and we'll teach a sermon, and we'll make points about that. And, and we'll, you know, so you have all the subjects on faith. We have all the verses on healing. We have all the verses on love. We have all the ver- verses on um, um, the return of Christ. We study, the, you know, Jesus' second coming. We'll st- we'll go. And so we do a systematic study on, on a subject in the Bible. And uh, that is not an erroneous way to study the Bible, but it is not the only way. And I, my, my point is this, if you only study systematically, you, will, you, will, you leave yourself open for varied interpretations of what certain scriptures mean because they're not in the, the parameters of their setting. So we as good Bible students not only need to do, and I, and I teach systematically, but we also need to make sure we study expo- in an expository manner or even in, in an exegesis uh, of subjects, study books as a whole and not things out of them. Okay, we have to, in other words, uh, remember Jesus would make, you say, well, Jesus said such and such, but you understand, when Jesus preached certain things, he's preaching to people who knew the whole. They had to memorize the whole law. Okay, so when he made, he, he made a statement, did a systematic teaching, it was to a people who already had the parameters of the whole. Okay, and so we need to make sure that, and that, that brings balance. Here's what happens. If you get somebody who just teaches a subject, they come up with crazy things if they don't balance it with the parameters of the whole. Now, I'm not saying to do systematically is wrong. I believe in I believe it's a good way to teach. I mean, you can, it's hard to teach healing without going through and getting all the scriptures out. <clears throat> so that is a correct, that is a correct, it is not the only, and you should not limit yourself to only studying that way. Okay? You need to study the whole. Um, for example, somebody said not that long ago, you know, if we would just, if, if the guys who wrote the canon just left out the Old Testament, we wouldn't have all the problems we have in the church because that's just written to the Jews. Now that is, and that, and they're, they're a systematic teacher on a certain subject. But here's the problem with that. Every time Jesus referred to and said, you have the scriptures, you know what they say, what were they referring to? The Old Testament. When Paul said, as the scripture says, what was he referring to? The Old Testament. The Bible says in the New Testament that the things that happened to the Jews were written as examples to us. So if they just left all that out, we wouldn't know what the example is. But see, it, it messes with their mantra to, to go look at Old Testament stuff. And so they say if they'd just been left out, we wouldn't have any of the problems we're having. Because then my teaching wouldn't have anything to contra- contradict it. See, we need to study the whole. And we need to, we, and you remember this, let me say this, because here, here's another one. People come along saying, that, well, Jesus never said anything about such and such type sin. Jesus did say, I did not come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. Now, Jesus was the fulfillment of the ordinances of the law. In other words, we don't go back and do all the sacrificial things for sin. We go through him. But the moral law, the moral code of the law hasn't changed. Sin is still sin. And just because he didn't say anything about, you know, homosexuality, well, but he said, I didn't come to do it with the law. So the moral code of the old is still relevant to the church today. Okay? He fulfilled the law, but he didn't come to do away with it. In other words, just because he didn't say such and such is wrong doesn't mean such and such isn't wrong. And the reason I kind of, Shannon has a friend she went to high school with, well, and they were posting, that they've gone to some very perverse lifestyle, and, and then they're posting on, on Facebook, I'm a Christian, and because, Jesus never said anything about what I do anyway. See, you do err. You do err in your interpretation of the Scriptures. And so I'm challenging our church. I can't, I can't be a, the, the, the whatever to all the other churches, but I can't be the ours. I'm challenging you to be a good Bible student. 
Not only study systematically, study uh, expository, study exegesis. In other words, be faithful to study the whole of the scriptures. Be a Berean and not a Thessalonican. These are more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they receive the word of God with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily to see whether those things be so or not. Let's, let's, do, let's be faithful to do good Bible study and good Bible interpretation and not just take a, a cute little catchphrase or a, 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 an, an excess in an area and run off with it without first putting in the parameters. Now, <clears throat> one thing that's kind of stirred this up in me, I know I'm going to get to my subject matter, I think, is doing this study on the life and teachings of Paul in chronological order. As I begin to study his writings as a whole, suddenly certain things are, make, are, are saying things in ways that I didn't see them before. And, and understanding how he writes makes a sense to me that I didn't make before. When you're just going getting the faith scripture here and the faith scripture out of this book and the faith scripture out of this book and the faith scripture out of this book and kind of putting them all the faith scriptures together, but leaving out the parameters of other things. Let's feel that like if you take all the faith scriptures out and kind of leave out, you know, a whole, then you might not get to the faith works by love. I, I don't matter if I got love. I just got faith. I got faith. I can be ugly and treat you like a dog, and I still get my answer because I got great faith. Well, no, because the, the, the balance of that is faith works by love, and if you don't have love, your faith won't work. Paul even said, if you have faith that you can move all the mountains and don't have love, you're nothing. So <clears throat> let's make sure that we study things as a whole and, and, and systematic, okay? Now, in our, in our circles, we tend, to be, uh, we tend to study things systematically on certain subjects, faith, healing, uh, 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 miracles, you know, righteousness. Didn't we study some of these subjects and, and, and just study them systematically? And there's a lot of good things there. But if we go put them back into context as the whole, then some of the, the, a lot of the excesses that we get into wouldn't stand the test uh, against the whole. Okay, we get, are, we, are we there? Okay, so I'm encouraging you. I'm challenging you. We want to be good Bible students. We don't want to run off and just say stuff and do stuff because we, we kind of, you know, got our little, a little, little light on a little bit of a scripture and, and run off with it and then make, start making it say things. And, and, and I guess something else kind of did. I was listening to a couple of preachers on a, on a, on a program, uh, an old program. It was, it, was, it was an archive thing. And, and one of them said, you know, I asked the Lord what this that particular word meant. He told me such and such. And, and, I, and I turned to Janet and said, you know, maybe to him, with his experience and his knowledge and the parameters of his life, that would be definite, that would be an accurate thing for him in context of all the other things he understands about God. But to go out and teach that as a definition, and it's not a definition, puts it into the parameters of your experience, and it can take on a whole different meaning. We have to be careful. When the Lord, somebody says, well, the, the Lord showed me this word means that, and you go look and you go, you go study out, and you can't find anywhere that it means that in uh, the languages or definitions of the languages. We have to be careful about those kind of things. Amen? So when someone says, well, the Lord showed me this word means such and such, and you go study out, and you can't find anywhere it means that, then you have to either back off and say, you know what, maybe in their experience of life, that opened, uh, opened something between them and the Lord as far as how... They understand things with their experience. It did, make, it did mean that as far as, and kept in context with their life and their experience. But when we take that and go teach it, okay, we, get, we, can, get, we can put somebody into gross error. We can put somebody into gross error. We have to be careful. Am I right, Brother Bill? Amen. All right, Dr. Bill gave me, gave me an amen. Hallelujah. Now, to this morning's message. That was for free. That was my mini sermon. M-I-N-I. -N -I. <laughs> Remember Brother Hagin? Had a mini vision. M-I-N-I. -N -I. <laughs> <coughs> Although he had many M-A-N-Y visions. Turning to Luke, we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost this morning. They're not getting you feel it all over for the first time, but they're talking about um, the infilling of the Holy Ghost and how, it, how we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and, and how it works, how, how he works in our life. So starting in Luke chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Um, and as the people were in expectation, all men mused in their hearts, whether uh, in their hearts, whether John were he were John were the Christ or not. Remember, you know, listen, people were looking for Jesus. They were looking for the Christ. They were looking for Yeshua HaMashiach to come. They had an expectancy. 
Amen? And hey, this is so important. Leaders, if you're watching me right now, do not try to stand in a role that doesn't belong to you. Don't try to be what you're not. Amen? And so John, John just answered and said, I indeed baptize you with water. Thank God he, he understood. He said, I must decrease and he must increase in one place. Amen. And he wouldn't step out of his role. We need to be comfortable in what God has us and what God has us doing and not uncomfortable because someone else is going to be greater or bigger or whatever. Right. Amen? I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Oh, glory to God. I thank God for the Holy Ghost fire. And I don't know why this woman, this, this necktie is aggravating. Hallelujah. Amen. And so G, John the Baptist says, there's one coming after me. Now he's out there baptizing in water unto repentance. An Old Testament form of baptism of remission of sin. But he says, there's one coming after me who's bigger, mightier than I. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Let me say something. We need some more Holy Ghost fire in the church. What does the fire do? The fire, and, and fire, listen, it purifies, it purges, it cleanses. Boy, I tell you, when you get baptized in the fire, you come out, when you come out of the fire, everything else is burned up. We need to have some burning. Now, I'm going to say this. It's not going to be pleasant if you're getting burned and you've got a lot of wood in your life. But I'd rather be left over with a half ounce of silver than, than four pounds of gold, I mean, of, of, of fire, of, of wood. I'll get it right in a minute. Gotcha. Now, somebody's going to go take this, take it off the internet, quote me in mis in where I misquoted myself, and then they say, he said such and such. Well, bless you. Amen. No, there's one coming after me who's mightier than I. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, it says, For one spirit we baptize into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we're bond or free, we're all made to drink into one spirit. What's he saying? Jesus baptizes us into the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost baptizes us into Jesus. There's a lot of teaching in the church that when you get born again, you're baptized. That's, the, what you're baptized, that's not baptism in the Holy Ghost. By one spirit, we baptize into one body. See, so when, when you got baptized and, and when you got born again, you were baptized into the body of Christ. You were immersed into the body of Christ by the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> but John said that Jesus is going to baptize us in the Holy Ghost. See, it's a whole other thing. We need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And that's not only an initial baptism. We need to have refillings. Amen? Just because I, you know, I had a glass bottle uh, Pepsi made with real sugar doesn't mean I'm not going to have another one. Hallelujah. Or a cheer wine. Or a knee-high orange. Or a knee-high grape. Or a Mexican Sprite. Hallelujah. Mexican Sprite's made with real sugar in glass bottles. Mexican Coke's made with real sugar in glass bottles. Tastes better. Now, just because I had one and drank it all the way down, that mean I'm not going to have another one. I baptized my stomach in Coke. <laughs> Hallelujah. And guess what? I'll do it again. Amen. You know, just, just because we have one good T-bone don't mean I'm not going to have another one. Amen. Matter of fact, if it's really good, I might go back the next night, night and get one. You go to the Japanese steakhouse and you, you know, they say, how was it, boss? It was great. See you tonight. Or see you tomorrow. They expect you to come back and get it again. And you, you want to, but you can't. You know, you can't go back every day and eat. I mean, you know, it's good. Hibachi shrimp, hibachi chicken, hibachi steak with fried rice. Hallelujah. Extra fried rice. Yeah. Glory to God. Jesus said in John 14... I'll pray to the Father, and he'll give you another comforter. Now, you know, the Amplified, another comforter, help, counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strength, and understand by, that he may abide with you forever. Amen? God wants us to understand that the Holy Ghost comes to be a, an active role in our life. Say, so the Holy Ghost has come to be, have an active role in our life. We need, we need to get back to trusting and leaning on and depending on the working of the Spirit in our life. Amen? We need to understand the Holy Ghost is there as a helper. Now, he's not going to be a doer. See, here's where we get into trouble. You know, we come back and say, now the Bible tells us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. Now, we're not talking about doing it in the flesh. There's a helper. I said, there's a helper. There's one on the inside of you who's going to help you. The grace of God has given you a helper. Amen? That is a grace. But he's not called the doer. Come on now. He's called the helper. 
He's going to help you. Amen. The Spirit himself helpeth us with our infirmities. That's weaknesses. Infirmities, I know we, call, we talk about people being infirm. You know, we're thinking they're sick, but the word weak, it means weaknesses. He helpeth. He takes hold together. The three Greek words make up the word helpeth in the Greek there in Romans. It says, where the Spirit himself helpeth our infirmities. The three Greek words put together mean to take hold together with against. He takes hold together. Everybody say together. together. Didn't say he does it for us. He didn't, he didn't say, he didn't say, he, yeah. Yeah, this blind follow the blind, we both fall in the ditch. Aren't you glad I'm not blind this morning? We're, we're not in the ditch. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Stay out of the ditch on that one. He takes hold. Everybody say, takes hold. Together. That's, that's Romans. Where is it? Somebody help me here. On the screen. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth. Take hold. Everybody say, take hold. Together. With, against, our infirmities. Now, all that language it means one thing. What? Who's involved? The Holy Spirit. No, who else is involved? Me. Unless we get involved, he's taking hold together. That means that we're working in conjunction with him. In other words, when he says, well, where is the vocation wherewith you are called? And, and we, we, we say, well, I, I need to make sure I'm not doing this. We can trust him to come take hold together with us against a weakness in our life. Where we're not depending on our, just our willpower. We're trusting the Holy Ghost to rise up as we say, no, I'm not going to do that. And he comes alongside and says, I'm here to help. Glory to God. I'm here to put you over. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> but unless you're involved, he ain't doing it for you. So we got teachings out there that people are being taught. You know, it does, just lay down, it doesn't matter. But I am telling you, unless you are active, he can't take hold with you, together with you. We have to have his aid. But he's not going to do. He's not called the holy doer. He's the helper. The parakletos. You know, the strength and the comfort of the advocate. The helper. Brother Hagin said he's also called the standby. He used to have a little four, he had a four-barrel car. And riding across the desert floor, <clears throat> they don't, back in those days, we didn't have electronic fuel injection, you understand? That was all old technology. It was, and listen, those cars were muscle cars. You could, you could, you could fix your carburetor so it would put more in, or you could change the mix. You could, you could amp up the horsepower just by going and changing the, the, the gas air mix. And guys are sitting in old shade tree mechanics. They go out in the backyard, they'd open that up, and they'd get in there with a screwdriver, and they'd have somebody pressing the accelerator, and they'd, and they'd listen, and they kind of get that, yeah, that's right. And they'd go out, and they'd just wind it out, and just, you know, the speedometer would go this way, and the gas needle would go that way. <laughs> Hallelujah. they just sucking that goo juice right on down. Praise God. <clears throat> but who cared? It was 10 cents a gallon. You know? I mean, you, you, for two bucks, you can fill up your tank. Hallelujah. For two bucks now, you can drive around the block. Hallelujah. But you know, he used to stay, he said, Brother Hank said he'd be, he'd be pulling that, he had, a, he had a travel trailer, he would travel with the whole family in the summer when he could preach. And so they'd be going through, the, riding on the desert floor, you know, and that, that's two, two barrels kick in. But he started in the mountains, he said that, that extra, the other, two, the other two barrels of that carburetor would kick in. I want to tell you something, as you go through life, a lot of times you're going to be going on just and walking with the Lord and walking the way you're supposed to walk, but you encounter a hill, you encounter something big. If you'll learn to trust Him, He'll kick in and get you going. But you've got to trust Him. You've got to know, you, this is on purpose, this isn't by mistake. It's designed that way. You've got to be, go, you've got to be doing your part. But, you know, the Holy Ghost isn't driving your car down the road for you. See, we, we, we've, get, we've gotten off in some areas. We, we've gotten some ideas that are wrong. And, we, and we, we want to rest when we're supposed to be pursuing the Lord and doing the will of the Lord and, and acting on what the Word of God says and then trusting Him when it's beyond our ability and beyond our capacity and beyond our, 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 our whatever to get it done, that He's going to come in and now take hold with us against it and kick in that extra two barrels of carburetor and get us down the road. Amen. Let me say something. We've got to be aware of His presence to get there. Amen. Amen. We've got to be aware of that He's there. Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to, to, we're going to have to stay full of the Holy Ghost. Amen? 
And, and we have to talk to ourselves say, He's not the holy doer, He's the holy helper. He's my standby. He's not my driver, He's my helper. He's my standby. Amen. And if we'll, have, if we'll begin to trust and rely on Him in those times, listen, there's things you're going to do you need to do yourself. If your car needs gas, go fill it up. Don't wait till you're down you know, on the side of the road going, well, Lord, I'm out of gas. Supernaturally put some in there. Well, I, I, urged, I urged you three times to stop at the last three gas stations and fill up, and you, you drove right by them. We got to listen to the Holy Ghost. We, we keep looking for him to get us out of trouble. Hey, you know what? If you listen to him, he'll keep you out of trouble. We keep waiting for him. I, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm, I can't take it no more. My goodness, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm like the old Pentecostals of the early 1900s who said, I'd rather have a snake tied around my neck than wear one of them worldly neckties. There was a great necktie debate back in the early 1900s. And the argument was, were, were neckties worldly or, un, or not? Then you come seven years later, and boy, if you didn't have one on, you were worldly. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. But I want you to know, the Holy Ghost, is, he, he's, he's there. He's your helper. He's your standby. He's on the inside of you. You can lean on him. First John 5 says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Glory to God. We got a greater one on the inside who will rise up on the inside of us in the hour of need if you will lean to him. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a hard thing for you to lean to him if you aren't communing with him and listening to him when you don't need him. Now somebody goes, you always need him. <clears throat> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't play semantics about this. The Spirit of God needs you to hear him when there aren't crises going on in your life. And you need to obey him then. And stop trusting him to get you out of a mess. Start trusting him to keep you out of the mess by leading you. They that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. You see, if, if you'll listen to him and let him lead you, then he'll, he won't lead you into trouble. Right. Amen. He will lead you in accordance with the word. He will lead you in accordance with the purposes of God. He'll lead you in accordance with the will of God and the word of God. Amen. Bless their heart. Lord, give them peace. <laughs> Amen. They need some peace. Hallelujah. Glory to God. They were called to be preaching, I think, or prophesying at some point in time. Lungs like that, they got to be called to do something. <coughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't that right? So I, you know, I, was, uh, I wasn't doing a study on this recently. I just kind of ran across something, and it, it made me kind of go this way. But, um, you know, where, where people say, well, Jesus made water. You know, they want to say, well, it's okay to drink wine because Jesus made water in the wine. Well, let me ask you something. If the Bible forbids drunkenness, if the Bible forbids, you know, the folly of drunkenness, and they were already well drunk, do you think the Son of God contributed to the further intoxication of those people by making fermented wine? It's a really good question. And I, and I had to say, according to the Word, he couldn't have. Now, I'm saying this for a reason. See, if we will let the Spirit of God lead us, He'll lead us in accordance with the Word. It won't lead us into the wrong places. God, I know that the Son of God did not help people get drunker. I can't believe he did. You know, that would violate his own word. I said that would violate his own word. Amen. The Holy Spirit, let's see, that, that was just a point to make this. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead you into destruction. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead you into places that are damaging to you. Now, you may, you may have to win a battle there, but he's not going to lead you and make it okay for you to get hurt. Amen. He's not going to tell you it's all right to go have sex with this person outside of marriage. He's going to lead you in line with the word. And so if we'll listen to him, he'll keep us out of trouble. Now listen, if you get into trouble, he'll help you get out of it if you'll look to him. But it's a, it's, yeah, it's a whole lot easier. We've had this discussion. It's a whole lot easier, not, not just sin, but it's a whole lot easier to go a little slower 
and doing what God tells you to do than going too fast and having to fix all the stuff you messed up while you were going too fast. It's just easier. You know, if, if you're going so fast, it leaves a wake of destruction. And then you say, oh, I'm, I'm a God really wasn't telling me this, go this way. And you got to back up. Guess what you got to do? You got to fix all the stuff you messed up. Now, they used to get upset with Brother Hagin because they come and say, Brother Hagin, we need to do such and such and such and such and such and such. And we need to do it now. And he'd go, okay. And wouldn't give an answer. He, he, might say, he might say, let me pray about it. <laughs> and they keep coming up, no. Keep coming up, no. Keep coming back, no. And they're, they're over here, you know, biting the nails. I mean, they're, we got to do this now. And until he had a clear from the Holy Ghost, he didn't go. Then they, listen, I'm telling you, we, when we start being led by the Spirit, by praying in the Spirit and knowing the voice of the Spirit, you know, when, we, when, we're, when we're in that place with him, and that's going to include re renewing our mind to the Word of God. Renew, you know, receive with me, not receive with me, yes, um, um, be not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. The Word of God and the Holy Ghost are working together in your life. And as you pray in the Spirit and study the Word, He's giving revelation to that and speaking to you and giving you guidance. But sometimes it's not going to come nearly as fast as you think it should. No, that's right. Almost never. If you pick up your Bible, you will not see the words, Hungry Jack, Instant Potatoes on the front. Hello? You open up and you don't find the, the first, the, the, the book of fast food drive through Things of the Spirit and things of the Word take time to, to and, and listen, a lot of, there's sometimes, it's nothing to do with you. It has to do with others that God's having to work with and through to get them in position to do what they're supposed to do for, for you or with you or in conjunction with that. You mean God's going to keep me from doing things I need to do? No. Others can. And it may have to be rewriting the plan, not because God's plan was wrong, but because people wouldn't cooperate with it. And so things had to back up and wait until certain things got into place. But see, if you're led by the Spirit, He'll give you peace even in the midst of that. Amen? Boy, I've, I've, way, I've left my notes so far behind, I don't know if I can go back and get them. <laughs> Amen. Let me look down here and see if I can get them. Um, Ephesians 5.18, well, I, I said 1 John 5, it's 1 John 4, for a year of God, little children, overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Let me say this, because I'm, I'm going to move a little bit further to another direction now. We've preached, we preach a lot about, you know, uh, keeping your flesh under, walking according to the word of God, this and that. I'm not I've never meant or insinuated or wanted to insinuate that I'm talking about you do it in your ability or willpower. You have to make a decision to do it. And you have to go that direction. But you have not been left help. Remember, Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. He said, I will not leave you without a paraclete. He didn't just say comfortless. He said, I will not leave you without a helper. Amen. And so as you start down that path and you make a decision, Lord, I'm going this way. Remember Paul said this, talking about, you know, the, 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 um, the um, thorn in the flesh. He said, I'm going to rejoice in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He wasn't saying he was excited about the fact that, you know, the devil was beating the brains out of him. He's rejoicing in the fact that when the devil comes to do that and I can't do anything about it, the greater one rises up and helps me through it. And it's a greater power. The greater power takes over. And I come through victorious and unscathed without the smell of smoke on me. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. So we're, so we're saying, what we're saying is this. Do what the, you know, Paul, Paul's letters, and we're talking about this on Wednesday nights, his letters are usually written in halves. Not all of them, but most of them. And, and the first half is who you are, what you have, um, how great you are, who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ. I mean, you're a blessing, you're this. And the second half is now live like it. <laughs> and here's how you live like it. Amen? But he's not talking about living like it in your power. There's a greater one on the inside of you who empowers you. That's, this is where biblical grace kicks in. Because there is an empowerment from God to do what God says when you choose to do what God says. Choose you this day, life or death, blessing or cursing. As for me and my house, we choose life. And what happens when you choose life and you choose to walk in the ways of the Lord? The blessing of the Lord comes on you. 
talking with someone recently, and they said, you know, they said, uh, they, they kind of, they finally, kind of, I don't know, blah, 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 glory to God. They finally figured out it was better to live in the blessing than in the mercy. <laughs> Amen. We mean live in the blessing. Walk in accordance with God, doing what you know to do, trusting God to help you make up the places where you're not making it up right. He, you know, he's empowering you. You keep a repentant and a humble heart before him. You know, listen, it's, it's good to be repentant before God. Godly sorrow, work of the What do you mean godly sorrow? When you, when you violate your covenant with God, when you violate your relationship with him by doing something, be repentant. Amen. Godly sorrow works repentance. What happens in that repentance? Restoration. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Amen. And when you're restored, hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Man, you get back into the place of restoration, and you can just go on like nothing ever happened. And then the Bible tells us if our heart condemns us not, we have confidence toward God. What happens in restoration? Remember that how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen. First John 1 John 1.9. If we, if we sin, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us of our sins. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Amen. What happens when we repent? The consciousness of our being is washed. And we have confidence toward God. Hallelujah. So we've got people teaching people not to repent because that first John 9 was not written to the church. No, 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 no. It's written to the church so that we can cleanse our conscience so that we can stand without, with a pure conscience before God. And if we do that, we have confidence toward him. And we know he hears what we ask for. Amen. It's not just don't sin because God don't want you to have fun. Sinning taints your consciousness. And if your consciousness is tainted, you don't have confidence toward God. What's confidence? Faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. And so when you're in that state, you're not pleasing to God. God doesn't hate you. God's not ready to cook you on the the altar of barbecued sinners. He still loves you. Because he made provision that if, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He made provision for the failure if we failed. But it wasn't so we could fail. It was in the event that we did. His love and his grace made a provision to bring us back into restoration. But we still have to be involved in the process by repentance. That's not a work. That's some of the stupidest things I've ever heard. Repenting is a work of the flesh. No, it's a Bible method to get your conscience clean so the blood of Jesus cleanses it so that you have confidence toward God so that you can live by faith and get the answers you need. Glory to God. Amen. See, when Paul says what worthy of vocation, he's talking about saying, well, the Bible says to live this way, I'm going to live this way. Not because you get up the morning and go... I'm not, I'm not, Lord, I thank you. I made a decision. I'm not going to do that. Now, that temptation is trying to get me, but I'm now going to trust the Holy Ghost to rise up in me and take hold with me together against that. And I say no, and he empowers me to walk in the no. Because I said no. The greater one on the inside of me now rises up and empowers me because I said no. He empowers me to live no. To that, glory to God. Anybody getting blessed? I'm getting blessed. Hallelujah. This wasn't my sermon. How do you know? Because you look at my notes, see, I, none of this is in there. Well, a couple scriptures are in there, but that's about it. See, when we, when we pray in the Spirit... Isaiah said, that for stammering lips and another tongue, we speak to this people to whom he said, this is the refreshing wherewith you shall cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Because 1 Corinthians 14, 21, he says, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. For all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Now he was saying, he's talking about tongues here. <clears throat> so he didn't quote the whole thing, but we understand, with stammering lips and another tongue, I'll speak to this people. This is the refreshing. Church, can I say something? There are a lot of things fighting to be your refresher. There's a lot of things fighting to be your refresher. 
It could be video games. There's nothing wrong with a video game. But if it's, if it's what dulls you to everything around you and kind of gets you where you can forget about everything around you, if watching, you know, marathons of movies is how you hide from all the things that are, and you're not getting rest, and so you go hide in something else, you're not getting refreshed. Amen? You know, some people's chemicals, it's, it's, it's substance abuse. You know, smoke some dope, drink, um, you know, go shoot up, drop some pills, get, go get some prescription pills. If they're becoming your refresher, well, and a lot of times that's what they are. You know, some people take, take pills because they can't get refreshed and they're not praying in the Holy Ghost enough. Satan's looking for all kinds. Listen, it might be alcohol. It might be pot. It might be cigarettes. It might be, um, might be some heroin. It might be some designer pills. It might be food. Hello? You're sitting down and eating, eating six people's worth of food. Because it, 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 gives, it gives you, it, gives you a, 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 it really gives you a peace. You're using, it, you're using it to satisfy yourself. Amen. Now, I love chocolate milk. I do. I love chocolate milk. Now, I do not like the true mood. It's the high fructose corn. It's got a bitter taste to it to me. You know who has the best chocolate milk? Food Lions that has the real sugar in it. Not food, they're, they're half gallon jug with the real sugar in it. It sounds good. Huh? Whole Foods has glass bottle. Yeah. Woo! Glory to God. <laughs> now, if every time I get upset, I go get me a thing of chocolate milk, what am I doing? I'm letting chocolate milk be my refresher and not the Holy Ghost. That's pretty good right there. Amen? So, let me say this. There's a, there's a battle going on in the church about things that's okay to do or not okay to do. And really what they are, they're just refreshers. And we need to get back to letting the Holy Ghost be our refresher. We need to get back to, you know, um, praying in the Spirit. When, I, when, when things are going wrong, I go, Instead of pass me a quart. Well, I could put down some chocolate milk. I can. I mean, I just like the flavor. I like, I like cold drinks. I love for cold drinks to go down my throat. So I, I, I got around now the house. I keep half gallons of, uh, of water and get them cold in the refrigerator. And I just go up and, you know, if, my, if, if I feel a little hungry, I want, I get to. <coughs> Hallelujah. Tell myself it's sweet tea. And it takes the Holy Ghost to believe that. <laughs> Amen. But notice he says here, this is the rest we with you cause the weary to rest. We've got to get back. Let me say something here. When we use other refreshers, they don't give you rest. They don't refresh your weariness, whatever it is. If it's food, <clears throat> if it's drugs, if it's, if it's alcohol, if it's, if it's uh, uh, glass bottled sodas. I had to go there. Because if, there if, there, if, there if there's what you get to get peace. We're all looking in the wrong place. Amen. Hello. Let me, let me learn how to sleep. If you have to sleep too much to get, your, get, your, get, your, get away from your weariness, you will not get rid of your weariness. Why? Because it's spiritual. If we'll get back to praying in the Spirit, if we really become Holy Ghost people again, and we trust the Holy Ghost to rise up on the inside of us, and we pray in the Spirit. This is the refreshing wherewith the, you cause the weary to rest. The weariness that is a spiritual battle will be abated. And as Jude 20 says, Jude 120 or 20, however you want to say it. <clears throat> he that speaketh in an untongue, or he that prayeth in the Spirit, edifieth himself. There's no substance and there's no food and there's no drink that can edify you. Nothing on this planet you can take externally that will edify you. That will rid you of your spiritual and emotional weariness. But the Holy Ghost, praying in the Spirit. Now listen, now let me say this. A good diet, proper rest, that, those are natural things you should do. But they're, they're not going to be a substitute for weariness that's come on you. And you're trying to use those as the weariness refresher. They're not. 
Praying in the Spirit is the rest you need. And you'll cause the weary to come to rest. Hallelujah. I remember back in B.C. days, people were talking about, you know, we're going to get plastered tonight, and you think, okay, you're going to get wasted. And you, you feel really good during your wasted hours until you get to your waking hours. You got cotton mouth and a hangover and all that kind of stuff, and you're, you're, you think, why would anyone want to go enjoy five hours they can't remember so they could endure 12 hours of what they do remember? <laughs> think about it. Had a good time last night, would you? I don't know. But don't, don't talk so loud. Oh, man. You know, you're in with a tongue depressor taking the tongue off the roof of your mouth. <coughs> Remember, you just call it cotton mouth. Because you, you dehydrate yourself. Hello? And a lot of people, for a lot of people, it's just when, when you're young and in college, usually it's because you want to prove that you're an adult. But people who continue on to older life, a lot of times they're doing that to get away from their problems. And there's an answer that you can find a rest that you won't find anywhere else. You'll find it in praying in the Spirit and the Holy Ghost coming up on the inside of you. And you wake up refreshed. Amen? Hey, remember the book of Acts? These men, you know, they came out mocking them, saying these men are full of new wine. And Peter Kevin said, these men are not drunk as you suppose seeing us, but the third hour of the day, about 9 o'clock in the morning. You know, right around that time of year, the Jewish day started, about, it started at sunrise, so around 6. So about 9 o'clock in the morning, these men are full of new wine. I know they're not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. So they got full of the Holy Ghost. At Ephesians 5, 8 says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled. The word filled means to be crammed with the spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Making melody in your heart to the Lord. See, God wants to cram you with the Holy Ghost. He was just so full of the Holy Ghost, you ooze. I remember one time we were coming back from, um, we were coming back from Europe, had the whole family with me, and for some reason, how the seat arrangement was, Janie was in the aisle over from us. So, you know, we were, I think it was a four, two, it was a four, uh, three, four, two setup. Sometimes they're two, five, two, sometimes they're three, four, two setups on these L1011s or these, these you know, uh, MD11s. You got, you got Lockheed 1011s and the, and the, and the McDonnell Douglas uh, 11s. MD-11s. And so the, the different ones will configurate their, their seats in a different way. The, this was an L-1011. We had a, we had a three, four, two set up. Okay. So me and the girls and Nathan were in the, in the four. Janie was across the aisle in the, in the seat with the, the, um, the three. And there were two South African uh, uh, airline pilots sitting with her. Well, she was on the aisle. They were in the middle. And as soon as they got on, they started drinking. They started calling for the waitress, the, the stewardess. And they just, they just started... And about halfway through the flight, they were so full of the alcohol, they were sweating the smell of the alcohol. She could smell the alcohol coming out of their pores. Well, see, God wants to do that to you with the Holy Ghost. He wants to be crammed so you ooze Holy Ghost. Amen. He wants you to take in so much Holy Ghost, you start oozing Holy Ghost. Amen. And see, for her, it was, it was not obnoxious because she couldn't stand the smell of it. Okay, so that's, but that's what that world has a replacement. Satan has a replacement for what God wants to do spiritually. He got them, they were, they were inebriated and so crammed with alcohol, they were sweating it. God wants you so full of the Holy Ghost, you're oozing Holy Ghost on people. And in the circumstances, Holy Ghost is being oozed. And in the situations, the Holy Ghost is being oozed. How do you get there? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Make a melody in your heart to the Lord. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Singing spiritual songs. <clears throat> this is what I'm saying. If you're going to have the Holy Ghost take hold together with against, you have to do something. You can make those decisions to walk that way. And I'm not talking about, hey, diddle, diddle. Hey, walk this way. Okay, anyway. I don't even remember what group that was. Aerosmith. There you go. Okay. Nathan, Nathan says, you don't know who the group I said, son, in my day, we were top 40 people. We didn't care about the group. It was the song. So you might, that's why you always have this one hit one that's great, I like the song, but they didn't, they didn't follow the group, you know? And when they had the one song, and some of y'all remember, uh, Come and Get Your Love by Redbone. Okay, man. It was a Cherokee group. They were a one hit wonder. And I bought the album, and I know, well, actually, I bought the eight track. I know why they were one hit wonder. Yeah. 
Because Come and Get Your Love was the only song on the whole thing that was catchy and good. Okay? Well, how did I get off of one-hit wonders and, you know, walk this way? Yeah, God wants us to walk certain ways. But if we'll get full of and saturated, be filled, be crammed. I mean, the word means to be crammed, to be saturated, to be, to, to be initiated into. I mean, just saturated and crammed with the Holy Ghost. When the circumstances of life arise, and when the circumstances of life come against you, when you begin to take your step and say, no, I'm not going to do that, the standby will kick in. When the weakness of your flesh it, it says, I can't make it, the helper comes in and takes hold with you. Remember Jesus. Now remember, Jesus isn't here. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, I'll send you another now, the word another in the Greek where he says, I'll send you another parakletos, the word another means one after the same manner as myself. So Jesus said, I'm sending one just like me. Say, come unto me all that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy. He takes hold together with against. He yokes up with you. He ain't dragging you, but he's helping you. You might be a Shetland pony and he's a Clydesdale or a, a Belgian draft horse. But you've got to do your part. Amen. And he'll help you. Amen. Glory to God. You make anything out of this? Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. Praise God. Tonight, uh, church. Tonight, youth. Have a great day in the Lord. Father, we bless the people in the name of Jesus. We thank you that the word of God works. The word of God's powerful. Thank you that we walk in the light. Glory to God. As you're the light. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. And we're going to trust the Holy Ghost to empower us. We're going to trust the Holy Ghost that when we have need, he's going to step in and be our standby. When we, have, when we come to the end of our ability, he's our helper. But we are going to do what your word says to do. That is not an act of the flesh. That is an act of, the, of obedience to the word. And that you're going to join up with us when we step out. To do your will, you're going to come along and take hold together with us against that infirmity and see us through by the power of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.